This is National Educational Television, a program distributed by the Educational Television and Radio Center. definite relationship insofar as the gases in the atmosphere are concerned. For example, we breathe in air and from that we take uh, oxygen and of course we exhale carbon dioxide. Now contrasted to that, the green plants during the daylight hours take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen so that basically we have a very simple relationship here in nature. Now using this uh, rather nice equation, scientists have worked out uh, all sorts of complex techniques for these two gases, uh, especially for oxygen. And so to tell us about some of the things in this field, we've invited as our special guest on Science in Action an authority in the field of anesthesiology. He comes to us from the San Francisco Hospital where he heads the Department of Anesthesia. I'd like to have you meet him, Dr. Charles Wyckoff. How are you, Charlie? Thanks, <laughs> Earl. I'm glad you started out with that equation on uh, plants and animals. It's terribly important. Uh, oxygen is very important to all living things. Uh, we can live for uh, considerable periods of time without uh, food, without water, but uh, we can't live very long at all without uh, oxygen. As a matter of fact, the human being can live just a matter of a few minutes or a few seconds without oxygen. Well, let's see. What do we know about oxygen chemically? Its atomic uh, number is 8. Uh, its atomic weight is 16. And if we were to write it, we would write it with the symbol O, or perhaps uh, sometimes uh, O with a subscript a small 2. Now, this cylinder of oxygen here would be under pressure, I suppose, of about, what, 2,200 pounds? Uh, 2,400 like pounds. 24. This uh, tank has some oxygen removed from it. <clears throat> I'll uh, turn on the tank and uh, make sure our gauges are set right here. Uh, I'd like to put some oxygen in the uh, beaker here for you, Earl. The oxygen is uh, heavier than air so that uh, it's 10% heavier than air, so that as the oxygen goes in the beaker, the uh, air is displaced. About now, this beaker is filled with oxygen. It's, uh, you can't see it because it's uh, colorless. In fact, it's uh, invisible. Have some, Earl. Well, it certainly doesn't look like very much of anything, but uh, I know that uh, well, there's no odor there, and of course it doesn't have any taste, and yet it's vitally important, as you said, to us for a great variety of things. Well, for example, this matter of combustion. Oh, yes, it is important in combustion, and we have an experiment here, which I think you'll find very interesting, demonstrating the necessity of oxygen uh, for burning. We'll light both these candles <coughs> and get them burning briskly. The one right here we will cover with a glass, and because the air is excluded from it, the oxygen, which constitutes approximately 20% of the air, will be used up and the candle should go out. Over on this side, we'll put in oxygen, which we have flowing with this tube, and when we cover this candle up, it should burn rather bright brightly. Now, uh, we'll see if our experiment works. Sometimes they don't. <clears throat> The one on this side, we'll notice, uh, starts to burn down. This one is burning very brightly. The oxygen has been used up on this side, and uh, it continues to burn because a constant supply of oxygen is going in. Now, this uh, need for oxygen for combustion uh, is uh, taken into consideration in some forms of uh, uh, fire, uh, not prevention, but uh, putting out fires. If carbon dioxide is uh, put on the combustible, it excludes the oxygen from the burning substance and uh, uh, thereby puts it out. <clears throat> Not only is it important to have oxygen for combustion in this uh, fashion, but it's also important to have oxygen uh, constantly in uh, tissue oxygenation. Now, we can, uh, we can live with uh, as low as, uh, uh, and live normally with 14% uh, oxygen in the air about us. 
However, when it drops down to about 8%, uh, we uh, become unconscious. And uh, when we're down to anything lower than 8%, we uh, 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 die. Well, that brings up this matter of high altitudes, of course. As we go up into the air, we have less oxygen than we have at sea level, and that, of course, brings up uh, all sorts of problems. Uh, that's right. At high altitude, we have a little bit less oxygen, but the more important thing is that the oxygen is not coming in at a sufficient pressure to force, uh, to force it into the, uh, into the uh, body. And our heart beats faster, we breathe faster, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, as I remember, the Mount Everest climbers uh, used uh, oxygen oh, at an elevation of about 18,000 feet. That would be over a little bit over three miles. The fires, of course, compensate for the lack of both pressure and oxygen by means of pressure helmets, which they use. That's right. These mechanical methods of supplying the oxygen our bodies need to perform efficiently are also adapted to your own field of research, Earl. In diving equipment, uh, as the individual is supplied with oxygen sufficient for his body needs. I believe you have some equipment to demonstrate. Yes, uh, well, our equipment, of course, uh, that we use normally is in shallow water, but this is the type of equipment that you'd have to use in deep water, and you, of course, know machinist mate, first class Charles Hess, who comes to us from Hunter's Point, the 12th Naval District, uh, made this gear available. How much do these uh, shoes weigh that you have here, Charles? They weigh 30 pounds a piece. 30 pounds a piece, that's 60 pounds, and uh, this was, you were sitting down there. I don't know, how, how about the belt? How much does that work? It weighs uh, 90 pounds. 90 pounds, and the entire uh, suit here without the hat would run about uh, about 200. About 200. Well, why don't you sit down there again, then? <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a strain on him. He needs a lot of oxygen yeah, for this. And, and I would like to point out one thing that's involved in this matter of very deep diving. Now, this is a standard helmet, but it's been modified by a rebreathing gadget on the back here. When you get into deep water and you're using compressed air, you have the problem of, of, of uh, the nitrogen in the compressed air uh, going into the blood and coming out at a slow rate. So by using helium and, uh, and uh, oxygen, you can go down faster and come up faster. And this is a helium rebreather. In other words, this is a helium hat which weighs, again, about how much was that? 75 pounds. 75 pounds. I can see why you don't have it on your head at the present time. <laughs> Well, while you're helping this uh, chap get out of his gear, we'd like to go on with our next uh, uh, approach to the uh, subject of oxygen, and that is the use in medical uh, administration, medical use of uh, oxygen. Uh, first, uh, we will discuss the uh, need of oxygen where there is anoxia due to an inability of the uh, lung tissue. Secondly, uh, failure of uh, blood transportation of oxygen, thirdly in the uh, tissue oxygenation, and lastly uh, the anoxia during uh, breathing. Fine, well uh, I was noticing one thing here as we we're about to go over into our hospital room that these plants are here. It brings up this whole idea of plants in hospital rooms versus corridors at night and plants put out oxygen of course. Is there any correlation there? Well, uh, plants put out oxygen during the day, about 10 times as much oxygen as they use, but at night they uh, take up oxygen. However, the amount of oxygen they take up is uh, not too great to be concerned about. A uh, plant will use about half as much oxygen as a, uh, as a uh, or twice as much oxygen as a human being uses, but you can imagine the uh, weight of a plant it would take to, uh, or the bulk of a plant to equal the weight of a man. So that really we don't have to be concerned about the plants being outside. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think the patient does more harm to the uh, plant than the plant does to the patient. Yeah, that's right. right. Shall we look at our next patient? Yes, uh, our next, uh, we're going back to our first point, of course, which was failure of lung tissue, and there are ways uh, in which this may be handled. Oh, by the way, I'd like to have you meet our second guest, who is Miss Amy Hacker, and she is a nurse anesthetist. Also at San Francisco Hospital. Now, this, I presume, is an oxygen tent. Yes, it is. In pneumonia, the diseased lungs can't function well enough to use the normal supply. We supplement it so that each breath they take is richer in oxygen than ordinary air. Let me show you. This gauge measures the flow. Here we're getting 8 liters per minute. This increases the oxygen content from the normal 20 to 50%. This unit behind me uh, circulates the oxygen, cools it, and absorbs the carbon dioxide that the patient breathes off. Not only is this, uh, ma uh, this uh, tent used in uh, pneumonia, but it's also used in other situations where there is lung disease. Uh, pre or occasionally, a patient will have an uh, uh, tooth pulmonary infarct where the uh, 
there is a, a plug of the blood vessel going to one part of the lung. The blood doesn't get to that part of the lung, and there's death of the lung tissue itself. This produces an anoxia, both because of the loss of lung tissue as well as reflexes, and for that reason, we administer oxygen uh, to the patient, which aids him considerably. Charlie, I've heard about these oxygen tents being used in cases of um, oh, heart failure. What's the condition? Uh, that's right. The pulmonary aspect of uh, heart failure is that the heart is not strong enough to push the blood through the lung so that the blood piles up in the lung, producing a congestion. Uh, this congestion prevents an adequate amount of oxygen going across the uh, pulmonary uh, the capillary, and for that reason, the patient doesn't get enough oxygen. The, uh, the oxygen itself uh, aids the myocardium, aids the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. I see something happening over here in the delivery room. Shall yes, uh, please. Mrs. Uh, Hackard is taking care or demonstrating the technique of taking care of a newborn baby who has a respiratory depression. The first thing she does is to uh, suck out the uh, uh, pharynx of the baby. This is necessary. The pharynx is constantly sucked out because uh, these secretions would, if forced down the trachea, would pr prove uh, difficult. Next, the uh, mask is administered so that the uh, oxygen will be forced into the uh, lungs. This uh, forcing in of oxygen into the lungs uh, expands the lungs and starts the baby breathing on its own. Uh, this occurs in uh, congenital atelectasis and other uh, situations of this nature. Now this, uh, this child is, uh, uh, as you can hear, breathing lustily on his own and uh, quite happy about the whole situation. <clears throat> the uh, technique of uh, resuscitation is described here uh, as we've presented it is uh, very advantageous to the newborn where there is respiratory uh, depression and the baby doesn't start breathing on his own. The Chrysler Chryselman resuscitator is a very good resuscitator as well as this uh, E&J resuscitator. Uh, the E&J resuscitator uh, has one uh, advantage that I'm particularly uh, like. Let's assume this is the lung of the patient. Uh, it inflates and then uh, it deflates and actually sucks out the uh, oxygen which goes to the patient. Uh, let's cut this down to simulate the size of a baby's lung and uh, uh, the, the negative pressure there aids in the circulation uh, by aiding in the refill of the heart. <clears throat> well, that would bring us up to our next point, which is this matter of the transportation of the blood. In other words, if you're going to have oxygen in the body, you have to have red blood cells, and if you don't have red blood cells, then you don't have enough oxygen. Uh, that's right. When we have an acute uh, loss of red blood cells, as in hemorrhage, it's uh, necessary to replace the uh, blood immediately, just as rapidly as we possibly can. However, and that's one of the reasons why we need our blood banks so uh, acutely, uh, and blood in our blood banks. The, uh, uh, but anyhow, while we're giving blood to the patient, we administer oxygen so that the patient uh, will be sustained uh, until his blood volume has been adequately replaced. Now, I see our patient has, uh, has been uh, taken out of the uh, oxygen tent, but he has something else severely wrong with him. Yes, I was looking at his chart a little bit earlier, and I noted that he had had a severe loss of blood a quarter or so. Now, I presume the first thing you will do then is to give him whole blood. And, uh, Miss Hackert, what uh, do you do at this time? Well, um, I'm going to give him some oxygen with the BLB mask. The BLB is the trade name. This is a mask that will fit real tight over the nose and mouth. The reservoir bag will empty and fill with fresh oxygen each time he takes the breath. He doesn't seem to like that very well, does he? He doesn't like anything on his face. For patients like this, we have another way to give oxygen. An angel cannula. This is a plastic disposable nasal type. Here, let's try this. With this, the oxygen will come from this tank, <clears throat> go through the bottle to be humidified, directly to the patient. Well, now we have the uh, blood started. Within an hour or so, uh, he will have replaced the blood that he's lost, and during that time, the oxygen has sustained him. Uh, boy, as far as this problem's concerned, you've got it made. After you get this blood, you'll feel like a million, at least you should. Oh, good. Well, then that brings us up to our next point, which is this matter of tissue oxygenation. And since that is very 
close to your heart in this uh, field of anesthesia. Why don't you take over on that? Well, thanks very much, Earl. I'd like to. Uh, we interfere with the tissue oxygenation, or I should say we alter the tissue oxygenation, particularly of the brain, in general anesthesia. Uh, we depress the normal, uh, the normal physiological process that the brain goes through. Mm. Uh, examples of agents we use to depress the brain are uh, nitrous oxide, ether, and cyclopropane. Uh, these agents all produce unconsciousness by their action on the brain cell and the alteration of the brain cell surface membrane so that it can't take up oxygen, even though the oxygen is present. It's altered and it can't take it up. Uh, we add oxygen uh, with the agent so that we sustain life as well as controlling the anesthetic mixture. Now, uh, Ms. Hackert has set up here a, an anesthetic machine which will demonstrate on our patient who is now in uh, condition to receive an anesthetic. He's very cooperative. This machine uh, we generally use in uh, surgery. It's set up to give an anesthetic of nitrous oxide. We'll put the mask on the patient's face and create an atmosphere uh, of his, uh, for him particularly. The bag is an extension of his lung. When he inhales, uh, the bag will uh, depress, and when he exhales, the bag will inflate. Uh, he has his own atmosphere. Now, we mix up a mixture here of nitrous oxide, which is uh, four to one. That is four liters of nitrous oxide and one liter of oxygen. The oxygen is 20% there and sustains uh, the life. Sometimes, and not infrequently, we add more oxygen than that. However, uh, for per purposes of demonstration here, we keep it to 20, which is just about the, uh, what we breathe. The four liters of nitrous oxide is 80% and will, over a period of several minutes, produce uh, uh, unconsciousness because of the uh, action of the nitrous oxide on the brain cell and at the brain cell surface. It takes a little while before the patient becomes unconscious because it, it has to act on, uh, at the brain. He seems to be out now. How would you go about bringing him back? Uh, we stop the nitrous oxide, uh, empty the bag, uh, flush in 100% oxygen, and uh, just as we uh, build up a concentration of nitrous oxide, and incidentally nitrous oxide has no physiological effect, uh, which is one of the few anesthetic agents that has no physiological effect, and he, he blows off the nitrous oxide and... Uh, uh, then, uh, because he doesn't have it acting on his brain, the uh, brain cell starts functioning normally again, and he wakens. That's certainly an excellent demonstration. That is a very quick tour. Well, well it yes, it is a quick tour, and uh, it's, it's rather complex uh, uh, field. Uh, perhaps someday we can take a, a whole program for uh, just anesthesia. Shall we go on to our fourth point, Earl? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. let's do that. Uh, incidentally, I would... Uh, I would uh, like to mention this matter of uh, failure in breathing. And of course, when you have a condition like that, then your oxygen becomes very, very important. Uh, that's right. Uh, during uh, the last few years, we've had a development in uh, <coughs> oxygen therapy, which is most important. Uh, it's, it's dramatic in uh, many instances, and particularly in the newborn. Uh, sometimes babies are born with uh, difficult, uh, an obstruction of their respiration. Uh, maybe the muscles of the throat don't work normally, or there's some other cause to uh, produce a, a respiratory obstruction. Uh, this, uh, this problem is more serious than the one we uh, saw just before with the resuscitation of the baby, because despite the uh, uh, starting of respiration, the respiratory obstruction prevents the uh, baby from breathing. I'd like to mention one thing right here, if I may, uh, Charlie, and that is that some time ago, uh, Dr. Wyckoff phoned to us at the academy and he said that at St. Joseph's Hospital, they were doing something there which was quite a bit different, and uh, they were filming it, and uh, so why don't we go back now, some two and a half years, and see what happened at that time. I'd like to, Earl. This uh, baby was, uh, was born with a respiratory obstruction due to the... Uh, <clears throat> due to the uh, inactivity of the vocal cords, <clears throat> which prevented the air from getting into the lungs. A tracheotomy was done, that is, the, uh, the uh, a hole was cut into the windpipe and uh, allowing a relief of the obstruction. Uh, a mystogen was started on this baby because of uh, uh, drying out of the secretions in the trachea. Uh, this mystogen is a combination of oxygen and uh, moisture. 
the baby is uh, put in a bassinet and the mystogen is placed beside the baby so that uh, a high concentration of moisture as well as oxygen can be administered. Now this nebulizer, as you see, is a, uh, is a technique of making a droplet size which is just the right size. If the drop is too large, it doesn't get down into the depths of the lung, or rather if it's too small, it doesn't get down into the depths of the lung, and if it's too large, then it has a uh, it precipitates out. Yes, well now, having the proper mixture, then I assume the next step would be to enclose the baby with this plastic covering that you mentioned earlier. Uh, what I'm wondering about now, uh, Charlie, is just how long does the youngster receive this treatment? Oh, for about an hour, Earl, and then it's necessary to, uh, it's necessary to uh, open up the uh, bassinet again and suck out the secretions which have collected in the trachea. These secretions are normally uh, coughed up and uh, and swallowed. However, with the tracheotomy in, the uh, patient cannot uh, cough them up and get rid of them, so we uh, have to suck them out with the uh, catheter, as you see in the picture here. Uh, this is readily accomplished through the tracheotomy uh, and uh, clears the uh, secretion. Mm. And that tracheotomy tube, then, is primarily for the purpose of clearing the obstruction. Uh, it clears the obstruction, but also is an easy means of clearing the secretion. This, uh, this is the nebulizer which we use on this uh, particular baby. Now, uh, the, uh, the baby that you saw in the uh, film has uh, since developed uh, quite uh, well, is uh, alive and healthy, and uh, we have a surprise for you, Earl. She's Good. here in the studio. Oh, Would you come here, Michelle? That's a girl. I'd like to have you meet Dr. Harold. This yeah, is our lady, Michelle, and she's a mighty fine youngster. You are really a cute little rascal. Have you ever been on television before? I know you're ticklish, aren't you? Huh? I wonder if we have the... Uh, <coughs> yes, we oh, have here. This is something for you, bro. That's right. Would you over. like to have this, sweetheart? Uh, this little, is a nice little A little bit earlier, we did a demonstration of a delivery room, and we had a very special kind of a baby there. Hey. And you are the youngest person that's ever been on Science in Action. You were too young to remember it, but that was two and a half years ago when you were only six weeks old. And I want to thank, thank you, Michelle, especially for coming and being with us here on Science in Action. You are a chief of the rascal. And you, Dr. Charles Wyckoff, our thanks also for being with us here to demonstrate these things. Thank you, Earl. Now I'll be back in just a moment with the animal of the week. Australia has often been called by the zoologists the land of the marsupial, and that is quite true because they have a great family, or great fauna of these pouched animals. The female has a marsupium, or pouch, in which she carries the young, uh, which are prematurely born. She carries them there until they're able to take care of themselves. Now, some of them are quite active, as evidenced by this horse rabbit, the name that my three-year-old has given to his favorite toy. Now, in the United States, we have the only one animal that fits into this pouch category, and that is the opossum. It's chiefly an animal of the eastern United States, but it has successfully been introduced into a variety of western localities. By nature, the opossum is a rather uh, nasty in disposition, but if you want to handle one, then you should have an animal that's been raised from its uh, infancy, and such as this one, which has been brought to us uh, from uh, the San Mateo County Junior Museum by its director, Mr. Woody Williams. Now, Woody, uh, how old is uh, this uh, animal present? Uh, Pokey is about uh, two years old, Earl. Mm -hmm. He's really a cutie. Now, this prehen prehensile tail, they use this uh, normally in uh, grasping trees and such things as that, and doesn't hurt them at all, does it, to... Uh, uh, no, Earl, it's just it's one of their ways of traveling. Uh, Pokey is a male. But uh, if, uh, if Pokey were a female and had youngsters, let's see, he'd be run about, what, uh, oh, about 4 to 15? That's correct, about 4 to 15. Sometimes the families are quite large. Let's, let's drop him down here just All a little right. bit. Uh, I'd like to be able to examine a little bit more carefully this, uh, this uh, beautiful head formation here. Uh, food habits, of course, of the opossum, they, I guess they, what, feed on everything? They're omnivorous animals, yes. Uh, what do you feed Pokey normally? Well, we feed him horse meat, dog food, dog kibbles, milk, mm -hmm. fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some people say they're not very smart animals, but uh, how have you found Pokey to be? 
Well, I don't know exactly, Earl. He sleeps most of the time. Mm -hmm. He sleeps in the day and he's uh, more active at more night. More active at night, yeah. Any other mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Well, Woody, I know you have a large number of animals down there at your San Mateo County Zoo, and I hope you'll bring some of the others up sometime. We certainly will be glad to, Earl. It is under the question of the tamest to have yeah, a possum right or a tame hand. possum. Well, oh, one thing, does he ever play possum like the possums are supposed to do? Uh, no, because he is not frightened. Oh, okay. uh, uh, the truth, uh, playing possum is simply because the animal is literally uh, frozen stiff. It's frightened. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> You have just seen another in the fascinating television series, Science in Action. Science in Action is produced by the California Academy of Sciences under the supervision of its director, Dr. Robert C. Miller. The preceding program was distributed by the Educational Television and Radio Center. This is National Educational Television.